welcome back in the 59 concept we were talking about the measures to improve availability in that the third one third uh, you know the major concept we'll try to discuss the defense in depth so the first one is the defense in depth we'll try to find the layered system so defense in depth will not provide an impenetrable cyber shield but it will help an organization minimize the risk by keeping it one step ahead of cyber criminals so if there is only one defense in place to protect data and information cyber criminals have only to get around that single defense so to make sure data and information remains available and organization must create different layers of protection a layered approach provides the most comprehensive protection if cyber criminals penetrate one layer they still have to contend with the several more layers with each layer being more complicated than the previous one so layering is creating a barrier of multiple defense that coordinate together to prevent attacks for example an organization might store its top secret document on a server in a building surrounded by an electronic fence so these are you know some uh, defense in depth that layering limiting diversity obscurity and simplicity so we'll try to discuss this one one by one, by one as said in the uh, layering one the next one is uh, we'll see the in depth process of the limiting so what happens in the limiting one <clears throat> so this limiting access to data and information reduces the possibility of a threat an organization should restrict access so that users only have the level of access required to do their job for example the people in the marketing department do not need access to payroll records to perform their jobs technology based solutions such as using file permissions are one way to limit access an organization should also implement procedural measures a procedural uh, a, a procedure should be in place that prohibits an employee from removing sensitive documents from the premises whereas the third one is the diversity so in the di diversity if all of the protected layers were the same it would not be very difficult for cyber criminals to conduct a successful attack therefore the layers must be different if cyber criminals penetrate one layer the same technique will not work on all of the other layers breaching one layer of security does not compromise the whole system an organization may use different encryption algorithms or authentication systems to protect data in different states to accomplish the goal of diversity organizations can cause security products 
uh, that security products manufactured by different companies for multi-factor authentication. For example, the server contains the top secret document is in a locked room that requires a swipe card from one company and biometric authentication supplied by another company. And another one is the, the uh, obscurity. So obscuring information can also protect data and information. An organization should not reveal any information that cyber criminals can use to figure out what version of the operating system a server is running or the type of equipment it uses. For example, error messages should not contain any details that cyber criminals could use to determine what vulnerabilities are present. Canceling certain types of information makes it more difficult for cyber criminals to attack a system. And the uh, last layer for measures to implement the availability of a server, uh, which comes under the five nines concept is simplicity. So uh, in this simplicity, the last layer, complexity does not necessarily guarantee security. If an organization implements complex systems that are hard to understand and troubleshoot, it may actually backfire. If employees do not understand how to configure a complex solution properly, it may make it just as easy for cyber criminals to compromise those systems. To maintain availability, a security solution should be simple from the inside, but complex on outside. So the next few slides gives the explanation of this defense in depth of this layering, limiting diversity, obscurity, and simplicity. Right? Yeah. So the, the, this is what, you know, uh, uh, for your purpose. So the next uh, uh, very important part in the measures to improve the availability to make it, uh, you know, good for five nines concept that 99.99% availability is the redundancy. So in this redundancy, we'll try to find the single points of failure. A single point of failure is a critical operation within the organization. So other operations may rely on it and failure halts this critical operation. So a single point of failure can be a special piece of a hardware, as you can see in the diagram that if this piece fails, then it will be completely detached. So as said, a single point of failure can be a special piece of hardware, a process, a specific piece of data, or even an essential utility. Single point of failure are the weak links in the chain that can cause disruption of the organization's operations. Generally, the solution to a single point of failure is, the, is to modify the critical operation so that it does not rely on a single element. The organization can also build redundant component into the critical operation to take over the process should one of these points fall. 
right so we'll see this <clears throat> one by one the redundants like if you have n plus 1 redundancy where n plus 1 redundancy in terms of car right so n plus 1 redundancy ensures system availability in the event of a component failure suppose if there are n components needs to have at least one backup component in this case so for example the car has four tires that is equal to your n components and a spare tire in the trunk in case of a flat that is plus one so in a data center n plus one redundancy means that the system design can withstand the loss of a component the n refers to many different components that make up the data center including servers power supplies switches and routers the plus one is the additional component or system that is standing by ready to go if needed an example of n plus one redundancy in a data center is a power generator that comes online when something happens to the main power source although an n plus one system contains redundant equipment and um, you know it is not a fully redundant system so this is one of the solution for the single point failure so the another important one in this redundancy is raid a redundant array of independent disk raid so this combines multiple physical hard drives into a single logical unit to provide data redundancy and improve performance raid takes data that is normally stored on a single disk and spreads it out among several drives if any single disk is lost the user can recover data from the other disk whether the data also resides uh, sorry where the data is also resides so raid can also increase the speed of data recovery using multiple drives will be faster retrieving requested data instead of relying on just one disk to do the work a raid solution can be either hardware based or software based a hardware based solution requires a specialized hardware controller on the system that contains the raid drive so here are you know uh, there are some uh, uh, the following terms describes how raid stores data on the various disk one is parity so that parity detects data errors and another one is stripping that writes data across multiple drives and mirroring that stores duplicate data on second drive so there are several levels of ride available as you know you can see in this figure that ride level zero to five that gives what are the minimum number of devices are required and their descriptions like for level zero the data stripping without redundancy advantage is the highest performance and disadvantage is no data protection in this case so as the levels goes on you can find uh, the number of devices which are required for this raid level suppose three then if the combination of data stripping and parity can be there 
in that the advantage is it supports the multiple simultaneous reads and writes operation and data is written across all the devices. Disadvantage is the write performance is slower than the RAID 0 and RAID 1. So to get more information about this RAID levels, uh, you know, you just, <clears throat> you know, I will give you the link where you can find the, the uh, to view the RAID level tutorial that explains the RAID technology. So in this, you find the one is in the redundancy, one most important one is the spanning tree or we call the STP uh, that compensate for the network failures. So redundancy increases the availability of the infrastructure by protecting the network from a single point of failure, such as a failed network cable or a failed switch. When designers build physical redundancy into a network, loops and duplicate frames occurs. Loops and duplicate frames have several consequences for a switched network. So spanning tree protocol that STP, we call the spanning tree protocol in this network, you can see, addresses these issues. That is the, the, uh, the loops and duplicate frames occurs in this. So then STP addresses, the spanning tree protocol addresses these issues. So the basic function of STP is to prevent loops on a network when switches interconnected via multiple paths. STP ensures that redundant physical links are loop free. It ensures that there is only one logical path between all destinations on the network. STP intentionally blocks redundant paths that could cause a loop. So blocking the redundant paths is critical to prevent loops on the network. The physical paths still exist to provide redundancy, but the spanning tree protocol disable these paths to prevent the loops from occurring. If a network cable or switch fails, STP recalculates the paths and unblocking the necessary ports to allow the redundant path to become active. So in this figure, you can see that suppose uh, the, here there are three switches, switch one, switch two, switch three, they are physically connected to each other. And then there is a loop here. If a PC sends data to a switch two, it can forward that data or packet to all its outgoing ports. So in that case, if they start sending those packets within this network, that will lead to a loop and the duplicates. So let us see this with an example, uh, next few slides which explain this. Okay, suppose in this case, in the figure one, you can observe that PC1 sends a broadcast out onto the network. So then it sends that message to switch two. So the trunk link between switch two and switch one, the trunk link one between switch two and switch one fails, resulting in disruption of the original path. Wait. Switch 2 unblocks the previously blocked port for trunk 2. When it fails, then it unblocks this you know, path when this link is failed. So this switch 2 unblocks the 
previously blocked port for trunk 2 and allows the broadcast traffic to uh, traverse the alternate path around to the network and permitting the communication that should continue to go on to the uh, you know uh, the destination suppose in this small network if you observe that pc1 wants to send a packet to pc4 and original path is from pc1 to switch 2 switch 2 to switch 1 switch 1 to your pc4 but if this redundant link is failed in that case switch 2 enables trunk 2 and the packet from pc1 it goes to switch 2 from switch 2 it enabled uh, you know a switch to broadcast this uh, you know the message to all its outgoing outgoing port except the uh, received one so then they switch to forwards that message to pc2 pc3 as well as switch 3 then switch 3 forwards that packet to switch one and switch one handovers that packet or message to pc2 so that is the uh, you know use of the redundant so here this spanning tree is used in the spanning tree it won't allow any loops but still the redundant paths exist between source and the destination and another case is in terms of the uh, the router redundancy. So in this diagram, you can see that the default gateway is typically the router that provides devices access to the rest of the network or to the internet. If there is only one router serving as the default gateway, it is a single point of failure. The organization can choose to install an additional standby router. So in this figure, you can see that the forwarding router and the standby router use a redundancy protocol to determine which router should take the active role in forwarding traffic. So here you can see that this is a forwarding router from this LAN to the internet. Okay. And there is a standby router is also there and there is a virtual router. So the organization, the keep of the forwarding router for the backup, they forward, they use the, the, uh, uh, the standby router also. So each router is configured with a physical IP address that is 192. dot. 0 0.2.1, another one is 192.0.2.100, another one is 192.0.2.2, the second router. So the forwarding router is listening for traffic addressing to 192.0.2.100. The forwarding router and the standby router use their physical IP addresses to send uh, uh, the periodic messages. The purpose of the messages is to make sure both are still online and available to the organization. If the standby router no longer receives these periodic messages from the forwarding router, the standby router will assume the forwarding role as uh, you know, you can see in the next diagram, you can find that it assumes that there is a link failure here. So the new forwarding, the standby router become active and act as a new forwarding. So the ability of a network to dynamically recover from the failure of a device acting as a default gateway is known as first hop redundancy. So these are the the, uh, the redundancies in terms of switch and the router. So in this redundancy, the router redundancy options are there. We'll see those router redundancy. Yeah, this is what we just explained. 
So in the router redundancy options, the, the, the following list of is defined the options available for the router redundancy based on the protocol that defines the communication between the networks. One is the, the hot uh, standby router protocol. Another one is virtual router redundancy protocol, which we just observed in the previous diagram. So in the hot standby router protocol, the HSRP provides a high network availability by providing first hop routing redundancy. A group of routers use HSRP for selecting an active device and a standby device. In a group of device interfaces, the active device is the device that routes packets. The standby device is the device that takes over when the active device fails. The function of the hot standby router protocol, HSRP, uh, that standby router is running to monitor the operational status of the HSRP group and to quickly assume packet forwarding responsibility if the active router fails. Whereas the second one, the virtual router redundancy protocol, that VRRP router, runs the VRRP protocol in conjunction with one or more other routers, which are attached to a local area network LAN. In a VRRP configuration, the elected router is the virtual router master and the other routers act as backups. So in case the virtual router master fails. And the third one is the router redundancy option. Third option is gateway load balancing protocol, GLBP. So GLBP protects data traffic from a failed router or circuit like HSRP and VRRP while also allowing load balancing, also called load sharing between a group of redundant routers. So these are router redundancy options to avoid the single point of failure. And we can find the location redundancy also. Yeah, this slide explains the one. The next one is the location redundancy. So as you can see in the diagram, an organization may need to consider location redundancy depending on its needs. So these, you know, the, the following are, uh, uh, you know, the outlines uh, that three forms the location redundancy one is synchronous asynchronous replication and the point in time replication so in a synchronous the uh, location redundancy that synchronizes both locations in real time and this synchronous is requires the high bandwidth to you know synchronize the uh, uh, routers and different locations and uh, the synchronize uh, the synchronous locations must be close together to reduce the latency whereas in asynchronous replication the location in the uh, location redundancy that is not synchronized in real time but close to it and it requires less bandwidth and sites can be further apart because latency is less of an issue in this case. Whereas point in time replication, it is updated the backup data location periodically and most bandwidth uh, conservative because it does not require a constant connection. So the correct balance between cost and availability will determine the correct choice for an organization. 
So this is based on the location, uh, the redundancy that's, that comes under your measures to improve the availability, availability by using redundancy. Next to measure to improve the availability using system resilience, the third principle. So that in system resilience, the resilience is the methods and the configurations used to make a system or network tolerant of failure. For example, a network can have redundant links between switches running the spanning tree protocol, STP. So although STP does provide an alternate path through the network, if a link fails, the switch uh, over may, be, may not be immediate if the configuration is not optional or you know, optimal. And then the routing protocol also provides the resilience uh, but fine tuning can improve the switch over so that network users do not notice. Administrators should investigate non default settings in a test network to see if they can improve network recovery times. So, resilient design is more than just adding redundancy. So it is critical to understand the business needs of the organization and then incorporate redundancy to create a resilience network. So then, uh, you know, it requires the, uh, another one is the application resilience. Yeah. So in this application resilience, as you can see in the diagram, the application resilience is the application's ability to react to problems in one of its components while still functioning. So downtime is due to failures caused by application errors or infrastructure failure. An administrator will eventually need to set down applications for patching and uh, you know the version updates or to deploy new features downtime can also be the result of data corruption so the equipment uh, the, the this downtime can also be as said the data corruption or equipment failure or application errors and human errors. So many organizations try to balance out the cost of achieving the resilience of application infrastructure with the cost of losing customers or business due to an application failure. So application high availability is complex and costly. So in this figure, you can see that uh, it shows the three availability solutions to address application resiliences. One is the fault tolerant hardware. Another one is cluster architecture. Third one is the backup and restore. You can see that as it goes, that the complexity and cost increases from backup and restore to your fault tolerant hardware. So we'll see the first one, the fault tolerant hardware, a system that is designed by building multiple of all critical components into the same computer that is fault tolerant. Whereas clustering is a group of servers that act like a single system. If any one system goes down, automatically the another system will become active. Whereas backup and store as such that copying files are duplicating the files for on multiple servers. So copying files for the purpose of being able to restore them if the data is occurs, uh, data loss is occurs. 
so this is another solution for uh, you know for improving the uh, availability by improving the uh, you know the high redundancy in single point of failure in terms of uh, the the software that is the system resiliences in redundancy we use the hardware uh, uh, redundancy so uh, for example to show the uh, the ios resiliency the operating system resiliency uh, for a particular uh, router in the network that is the network operating system we call that the ios is the uh, the interwork operating system generally executes uh, runs on the routers uh, in the network so for a cisco uh, router where the interwork operating system resilient feature is given as shown in the figure that the cisco routers and switches include the resilient configuration feature it allows for faster recovery if someone maliciously or unintentionally reformats flash memory or erases the startup configuration file so by giving that secure boot image here so the future maintains a secure working copy of the router uh, interwork operating system image file and a copy of the running configuration file the user cannot remove these secure files also known as the primary boot set so the commands as shown in this figure that secure this ios image and running the configuration file so by just running the secure boot image so that will run this secure file that image file that resilience image resilience that become active so this is the another system resilience to improve the uh, the availability of your systems so then we will we'll see the yeah with this i would like to you know stop the session in the next session we'll try to discuss the, uh, the what are the incident responses are there that we'll discuss in the next session thank you